Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verse 224, which reads as follows. Satchang bhane na kujhaya dajja appampi yajito etehi tihi thanehi kachhe devana santike which means one should speak the truth one should not get angry one should give even a little when asked with these three bases or through these three bases one will go to the abode of the angels So this was apparently taught in response to a question posed by Maha Moggallana who as we have heard was wont to visit heaven and talk to the angels there he was also wont to uh, seek out ghosts, spirits that were in trouble And get a sense of why they were born in troubled states But we have many stories of him up in heaven Talking to angels Often asking what they did to deserve to go to heaven Very useful skill this, Listening to these uh, You can't help but marvel at how uh, how beneficial it, it would have been to have someone around to tell you what's going on in places that you have no no ability to connect with. You, know? you think of what the internet has done, allowing us to see what's going on in places that we would have otherwise had no idea. It's kind of an extension of that. Moggallana was able to bring back news from other places, uplifting in a sense. There's quite an uplifting quality to a lot of Moggallana's uh, stories and uh, his descriptions of what went on in heaven. Anyway, on this occasion, he started to not notice a pattern. He went to heaven saw some heavenly mansion and an angel standing at the door of the mansion divine radiance glowing with a halo of some sort and uh, the angel comes out came out saw he was a, a buddhist monk and was quite uh, impressed so came out and paid respect to Moggallana and Moggallana said, wow, you have great, great power and uh, great glory. He said, what is it that has caused you to be born with such glory in, here in heaven? And the angel kind of looked away and said, oh, no, don't ask me that. And Moggallana said, well, come on, tell me, what what is it that Obviously you've done some great deed What is it that caused you to get this This position as an angel As a glorious Deva in heaven And when pressed the angel said I didn't do anything Really He said All I did When I was in, when I was in, in the human world So long ago I guarded the truth That's all it says. It doesn't go into detail, so maybe they talked more and got more detail about it, but that's all he got. And he was quite impressed by the fact that, that that alone led the being to be reborn as an angel. And so he continued on and talked with other people. One woman in heaven asked, her, what had she done? Same thing. Don't ask me, don't. 
don't ask me that and and he said come on and pressed she said well when i was on earth i was uh, a servant and my master was a cruel cruel being and i didn't do anything special i didn't do anything noble but i knew that if i ever got angry you know he would beat us and he would punish us and scold us and he was a very terrible person all i did is what really what anyone would do is i i, I determined in my mind that i shouldn't get angry but i said because i said to myself if i get angry he's going to beat me he's going to you know, maybe he'll, when he he cuts off the hands of slaves and and you know does terrible things, this this happened. These sorts of terrible things, of course, have happened in the history of humankind. My slaveholders torturing other human beings, who they called slaves. And she said, all I did was set in my mind that I wouldn't get angry. And because of that, somehow I'm here. Quite marvelous, actually. And he went on, and and he noticed this pattern. A lot of a lot of them would be kind of embarrassed and maybe surprised at how they got there. And many others, he said. Many of them, when asked, all they'd say is, "I'd say, well, I didn't do anything special." But one day, there was a a, a monk. At my door And I didn't have anything So I gave a little bit of A handful of rice Or I gave some beans Or I gave this Or I gave that And it was very It, it turned out to be a very powerful thing And somehow I was reborn in heaven And so Moggallana Collected all these stories And he went to see The Buddha And he said Venerable sir Is this really possible? That someone who guards the truth should be born in heaven Or someone who simply determines that they won't get angry And sets themselves in that uh, promise to themselves That determination Or if someone just gives a, a small handful of you know, worthless, Almost worthless food that is very, very little value Is it possible that this, this alone could lead one to be reborn in heaven? And the Buddha, as usual, as these stories go, he says, Why do you ask, Moggallana? Didn't you not see for yourself? And then he taught this verse. So, some people don't like, I think, these stories. Uh, I often comment on this, that there's a bit of a, a discomfort that comes from the sense that we might be talking about things that are based on faith, because many people have a strong sense that it's unlikely that such a thing as heaven exists or angels exist which is uh, unfortunate and fr from a buddhist perspective it's kind of unfortunate and and uh self-limiting but it has it says nothing about the actual lesson so we don't have to discuss this in terms of what it is that leads to heaven That's not really the most important lesson But if we can just say a little bit On what it means to be reborn as an angel Why one goes to be reborn as an angel And how we can have a sense That something like heaven exists Without relying on blind faith Is because Based on the actual lesson of this This verse and this story Our universe, our lives, our rebirth, of course, our, our, our course, our journey in samsara has very much to do, not everything, but very much to do with our state of mind and our inclination of mind. And our existence as human beings, our, our coming into being as a human, we can see how it's very much tied to many of the emotions that we share as human beings Many of the mind states, likewise with animals There's a, there's a, a tendency towards similarity And the idea that a very pure mind 
could be reborn in a very pure state or should be born in a very pure state as something very comfortable that sits quite well and, and seems quite reasonable to anyone who practices Buddhism. I'm not providing that as any kind of proof or evidence. But through the practice, one comes with, without actually having any kind of magical power similar to Moggallana or having angels come to visit you or anything like that. One comes as close to evidence, close enough to evidence to make one comfortable in one's assessment that things like heaven do exist, simply because of the power of the mind and the nature of the relationship between the physical world and the mental world. That is, it's hard for people to see intellectually. It's hard to understand unless you've looked inside, and not just inside, but looked at the world from a mindful, from a fundamental experiential point of view, where you're able to see what's happening. You're able to see the relationship between our minds, our intentions, our inclinations, and the world around us. So, so what are the lessons besides that? What are the lessons we can get from these, the, the verse and the story? And the, the most obvious lesson, of course, is that good things are good. Doing good is good, and this is a common theme throughout not only the Dhammapada stories and verses, but also the Buddhist teaching in general. That truth is very good. I mean, from a, from a worldly level, telling the truth is something that keeps you out of trouble. But another something that I've been talking about, and of course many more people than I have been talking about it, is that um, these days there's a situation in, in uh, the world in general relating to truth that I think is is not quite appreciated for its connection to the truth, uh, not quite as appreciated as it should be. We talk about people protesting uh, violence and, and racism and, and all kinds of injustice. And, and we miss the fact that the, pow the greatest power, I think to some extent we miss the fact that the greatest power, one of the greatest powers of, of a protest is not the anger. And I'll address that because I think it's important to point out and separate the two. It's the truth. Why these protests against injustice are so powerful is because injustice is false. Injustice relates to what is false. If you say, oh yes, I'm right to do this, this, and this, and you're not right to do it, we call it injustice, but it's actually, in fact, at its ba most basic level, falsehood. Right? False. It's not true that that's a good thing that you're doing. It's not true that you're right to do this, this, and this. And so... We, what we call protest, when we feel the power of a movement that that gains the um, gains the ear or, or gains the attention of the the world as a whole, it's it's most powerful because of how it resonates with people. Yes, they're right. Hmm? The greatest power of a protest, people with all these signs, they're telling the truth and. If they're not telling the truth, it, it, it has a different result. But the greatest power, how it becomes powerful and really brings about great change, is because it's an example of speaking the truth. The Buddha didn't just say, don't, don't speak falsehood. He said, speak the truth. Now, I'm not suggesting that the Buddha encouraged us to go out and protest. I think there are some challenges and concerns with that, but I'm not going to criticize or judge the, you know, the way of the world. I think... For people who are engaged in the world, you know, there's much more room for things like protest than someone like myself who just kind of tries to you know, help teach people from the outside. But uh, to, at least to some extent, the Buddha was was uh, affirmative in his uh, appreciation for speech, actually saying, telling someone when they're doing something wrong. If you tell someone when they're doing something wrong and your focus is on bringing the truth, it can be very powerful. The reason why it's often not very powerful and doesn't have great results is because of our 
um, being in contradiction to the second part, which is nakujeya, don't get angry. So a big part of protest is anger. And these days we see a lot of uh, Buddha, a lot of people angry, even a lot of Buddhists getting angry, which is unfortunate. And there's danger in that. Of course, there's suffering in that. We we read something on Facebook or uh, watch the news, and it makes us very angry. And we have to. I have to tell this person. Uh, I have to set them straight. So we think we're telling the truth. Got to tell them the truth, right? Uh, but it's not the truth. Our our intention, our inclination, is not to promote the truth. Our inclination is to make that person feel bad, hurt that person. It's not even really in the conscious intention, it's just this anger, the desire to change, the need to remove, to eradicate, to destroy. You know, it's, very, it's the same emotion that has led to so much violence uh, from, from the other side, from police, from, from people in charge. Nakujhiya. I, I remarked earlier, and this is of course the the Kodavaga, the the anger chapter. So I've been talking about this. I remarked earlier how um, if you when we watched in high school these protests from the, the civil rights era, it was quite remarkable. And I read something recently about Martin Luther King Jr.'s struggle with anger. He struggled with it because he he strived to. To, to love the people who were so hor horrible, who didn't seem to deserve any sort of love whatsoever. And yet he was a Christian and, and he wanted to follow Jesus' example of turning the other cheek. But there's a great power in that when you're not angry. You know, in, in a worldly sense, we can see when we get angry, we suffer. When we get angry, we hurt others. We create conflict. And the third, there's a good, there's good in giving. When you're kind to others, you build good relationships. You feel good about yourself. The world becomes uh, a better place. We're seeing it, I think, in many of the protests. People coming together as communities, helping each other. When someone asks, you give even a little. A pumpy, the Buddha said. Danja apampi ya chito. When someone asks, give even a little. They don't have to give a lot. So, this is from a worldly perspective. But uh, there's much. There's a much deeper lesson here. I think well, there is a much deeper lesson, and it's that it's it has to do with Mogalana's puzzlement, right? Because he knew that good deeds had good results. Why was he con why was he confused? He wasn't confused, but he 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 thought it remarkable. Why? It's because this seems to be highly out of proportion. It seems to have nothing to do with the significance of the actual act, which is which is an important lesson that goodness, karma, goodness and evil have much less to do with the significance of the act as they do to they have they do have to do with as they have to do with the significance of the state of mind when you do the act so telling the truth was much more about how it affected this person's mind and the reason why telling the truth is so powerful and why lying is so dangerous from a practical perspective, it doesn't seem like that. It seems like uh, sometimes if you lie, good things happen, right? If you tell the truth, you get in trouble and so on. But the reason why it's so dangerous is because of how it affects the mind. It may not have real consequences in your immediate reality, but it has lasting and, and significant consequences on your mind. Because when we lie, we're doing... The exact opposite of what we're trying to do in meditation is come closer to reality and closer to the truth, to straighten our minds, 
in relation to what is true and what is real. That's why we have this mantra of repeating to ourselves, not some religious mantra, but just reminding ourselves, this is this, it is what it is. When you lie, you do the exact opposite. You say, this isn't what it is. That isn't what it is. No. What it is, that it is not. That's basically what a lie is. And this affects you. And because of of your interaction with others and you're pushing that on other people, there's a very strong uh, inclination towards perversion. And by perversion, it just means that which is out of touch with reality, that which is inconsistent or out of line with the truth. Crookedness. Lies are a form of crookedness. They're a very strong form. They're, they're crossing a line. Anger. Anger is not necessarily harmful in the sense that you can often use anger, people will say, and this is the rebuttal. You can use anger for good purposes. So the anger of protesters, they see, hey, we're getting things done and our anger is really motivating us. Even if that point could be argued, which I don't think it's a, it could be very effective. I don't think it's a very good argument to say that good things are going to come out of everyone getting angry. Um, I think the real reason why that's the case it's not necessarily because of you know the results of our actions. You yell at someone, or you even you you have physical violence, and somehow that brings good or it brings harm. It's in how it affects your mind. And so, one thing that this verse and and this story reminds us of it's another important lesson is that our good deeds are not just about the results of the actions that they help us perform. It's about the ways that it changes our mind And the ways that the change of our mind Will affect our future Even if you don't believe in heaven Of course if you do it's much more significant But even if you don't You're going to come home at the end of your day And you're going to have to live with yourself You're going to grow up, you're going to grow old And you're not going to live with all the other acts and deeds of the people You're not going to live with all the things that you did But you're going to live with your memories of them You're going to live with your habits That you have cultivated based on your actions You're going to live with your state of mind And that's going to affect everything It will affect your domestic relationships It will affect your interactions with society It will affect your ambitions and your goals, your direction it will affect your meditation, it will affect your spirituality, and it will affect your travel in samsara, in, the, in this world and the next. Nakujeya. And uh, dajja, you should give, is not, the most important thing is not that it benefits other people, or that it benefits you in terms of your relationship with them. As I said, this is a benefit, but a very worldly benefit. A much more important benefit is the effect that it has on the mind, of course. And that, specifically, is why the, the amount has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with the reasons for doing it, the mind state of doing it, the inclination to do it. You know, really what one thing the Buddha, I think, is saying here is that it doesn't matter what you give, where you give, how you give, why you give, to some extent. And all those things are factors. But giving, as an example, whether it be material giving or whether it be giving help to others, is an inclination of mind. It's a practice. And if you take charity or, or, or kindness as a practice, you know, even even if it's just rote, you just say, yes, yes, I'm going to give. And that's not even something that was valuable to you, perhaps. That affects your mind. That uh, becomes a practice. That becomes your inclination, your way of life. You're a kind, generous individual. I've met people in Buddhist countries and, and people who are not Buddhist, whose immediate thought, when you go to their house, not just as a monk, but you go to their house or you go... 
visit them, you, you meet them, is what can I do for you? What can I give to you? Can I get you something? Nothing. To, I mean, of course, as a monk, I often get that from Buddhists. But even not as a monk, you you hear about different cultures and different traditions, even outside of Buddhism, that talk about charity to strangers, hospitality. Hospitality was a big thing in the Jewish tradition in some places that I grew up with. It's a way of life that is very powerful. Not because of, you know, oh, then, then your guest is happy or then you have a good relationship with your guest. But because of how the effect that it has as a practice. And this is the real lesson that we get from this story in this verse, I think. is It's all about practice. How are you going to live your life? Because when you start to focus on goals and you say, yeah, that's my goal, and you'll do anything to get it, you'll get angry, you'll lie, you'll be greedy. You'll, you'll, you know. You'll cultivate all sorts of unwholesome, you'll get what you want, you'll cultivate all these unwholesome mind states, and you'll get what you want, but at the end of the day, you've missed what's really important, the essence of the experience which is what meditation seeks to help us uh, fix. Our perspective. Our perspective on things should always, always be an experiential one, that we are with the experience, not caught up in some intellectual concept of what is right and what is wrong, but really in the present and seeing this is right or this is wrong. And to some extent, the the three examples, though they may seem a little bit arbitrary, are quite um, indicative of this because they relate to one of the three qualities of experience that we consider to be right or wrong. The first one is delusion. So telling the truth, one should tell the truth, relates to delusion. Delusion means the, the state of mind that is unclear or un out of touch with reality and there's many ways you can be out of touch with reality you can be perverted in your, your you know you can be um, biased in your assessment of yourself which is ego or conceit self-esteem and so on you can have wrong views you can just be ignorant or you just don't know you're just in darkness this is all delusion anger of course is is uh, the second one, and greed, the third one. So giving as a practice, yeah, uh, its most important benefit is how it seek, it serves to reduce our craving and our attachment because it's the opposite. It changes from acquiring and getting to giving and giving up. And so these three serve to to remind us of the importance of the mind and the importance of our qualities of mind, the quality of how we do things above and beyond what we actually do. So the important lesson of the verse is, again, what we do is not nearly as important as, as these, as our state of mind, whether we are greedy, whether we are angry, whether we del are deluded. Not just because of the effect that they will have on our, the results of our acts and our speech, because of course they will, but also because the effect they will have on our mind and on our, our mental health, even on our physical health, and ultimately on our, our fate as beings. So again, a, a, an important lesson for us as people who seek to see clearly and to understand reality and to free ourselves from suffering. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you for listening.